in fact, a good idea, even if he didn't do it. This is Captain David McIntosh of the PD Artillery uh, from South Carolina. He was born there in 1836. But by the time that he and Car Carmen were conversing, he was a, a lawyer living in Towson, Maryland. He wrote an article in Confederate Veteran called McIntosh's Battery at Sharpsburg. And uh, that, of course, attracted Carmen's attention. And so Carmen wrote to him for his memoirs of the Battle of Sharpsburg. And he gives, again, a fairly detailed explanation of what they did. I'll give you just a little bit of it. Uh, my first position when arriving on the field was at the Blackford House, where several shots were fired. From there, we went in a gallop across the field after one or two turns in the road into the second position indicated with three guns, one of them having broken down on the road and without the caissons, which had been outdistanced in the rapid march up from the river. About three quarters of a mile to the left of the spot where we unlivered was the village of Sharpsburg in plain view, but there was no visible line of battle on our side covering any portion of the intervening space. On our right was a cornfield and in front of a rolling ground of the Antio. Uh, again, he talks about a federal advance. He says, the advance was checked, and when, our, when the battery was finally charged, our canister rounds about exhausted. I believed it better to let the guns go and save the men. I always spoke of it as a capture of the battery, and I always gave Toombs Brigade the credit for its recapture. Uh, that brigade came up in irregular fashion through the cornfield to our right, and their presence was not known until I had ordered the men to fall back into the sunken road just in rear of us and to bring off the horses that were left uh, and the limbers. The enemy never got up beyond our guns, and no attempt was made to remove them from the field. That's McIntosh uh, and you know, his account. Now, writing to McIntosh was one of the privates in his battery, a fellow named James Napier. Here you can see the uh, Blackford House, the first position where they unlimbered their guns. Then they're going to move up this road and across and come into this field right here. There's McIntosh. Uh, this map shows him with three gun, guns because that's what he told Carmen he had, three guns. But this private, writing to McIntosh, uh, provides a heck of a lot more detail. For example, the gun was trained on a column of federal soldiers about three or four hundred yards away who were moving rapidly to the left. The Napoleon gun fired two shots and one of the rifle guns one shot from this position. If you remember, Captain Adams of AP Hill staff came up at a gallop and ordered you to report to General Kemper on the left of the cornfield, uh, which was on the left of the house we were on the right of. The guns were limbered up, cannoneers mounted, we went up at a gallop. We reached the cornfield, found a plank fence, and then a ditch on both sides of it. Uh, just as we reached the gate, a battery of four guns came out, and we had to wait for them to get out before we could enter. If you remember, just at this time, one of the men said to you, Captain, see, those men are leaving there. We had better not go in. Your reply was, I'm ordered to go in there and go to fighting. After entering the field, we obliqued to the left, and the gun I belonged to took position about 50 yards from the cornfield, etc. You know, see how much more detail he includes? And I love his explanation of this. He winds this up by saying, I'm quite confident I could locate the exact spot we fought on if I were on the field and the house we first took position is still standing. I've written you a rambling account of the drama that we took part in at Sharpsburg, and I've written a good many minor details thinking they might freshen your memory. You were a mature man at that time. I was but a boy. My mind, I guess, was flexible and retained these things better or perhaps I was worse scared than you, and they were firmly fixed by fright. <laughs> well, I think we've pointed out that uh, there's a good bit of infighting on both sides here uh, in this battle. Uh, people saying nasty things about each other. And what Confederate general has more nasty things said about him or says nasty things about others than James Longstreet? Stephen Dill Lee, who was no relation to Robert E. Lee, but commanded an artillery battery or battalion at Antietam. 
wrote a very long and detailed account uh, called New Lights on Sharpsburg in the Richmond Dispatch, a newspaper, in December of 1896. Carmen got a hold of it, and it is Stephen Dill Lee's account of the council of war that Lee holds on the night of the battle with all the generals coming in and Lee asking them all about the fighting on their part of the line. Well, this gets to Longstreet. And here's what Longstreet has to say. Referencing to the alleged council of war on the night of 17th of September of 1862, there was nothing of the kind unless the usual meeting of leading officers at night after a battle to make their reports could be construed into a council of war. Uh, and he goes on to say that General Lee knew before as well as after dark the work of the day, and hence there was no reason for him to ask anybody about what had happened on their front. You may see readily from his position and natural rides during the day, as well as from reports from his staff, that there was no need of information from his officers of the day's work. Much of it he saw, the little he did not see, or he could not see himself, he knew from the sound of battle and the movements of troops. If there was a council of war or anything that could be so called, I failed to hear of it until receipt of your letter. It seems quite out of the question that General Lee could have had a council of war in which a lieutenant colonel of artillery would have been present. <laughs> Lee, he's talking about. <laughs> but Longstreet also has some advice for historians. I beg leave to add that the official accounts are the only reliable source of information of the war and its battles. All accounts of postbellum make should be taken with a grain of salt, and unless supported by other and reliable persons or by circumstances that justify faith, should be salted away. If you care to compare them with the records, you will then be trying to controvert the records when all should be weighed as a judge weighs evidence before the court. So Longstreet's idea about how history ought to be practiced. And yet, of course, when one reads his monastic mathematics, there's an awful lot of creative remembering there. Madeline Dolgren. What the heck has she got to do with the Battle of Antietam? How many of you been to Fox's Gap on South Mountain? A few hands. How many of you remember the little monument there to... Uh, the general who was killed there, Sam Garland, kind of looks like a gravestone. That monument was placed there in the 1980s, long, not long after that property was purchased by the Central Maryland Heritage League. And I had always believed, as did everybody else, that that monument was placed there in the 1980s and that it was a fairly recent uh, desire of a group of Confederate veterans from Lynchburg, Virginia, where Sam was from. So I was very surprised in reading through the letters in the Carmen papers that here on June 16, 1897, is a letter to Carmen from Madeline B. Dahlgren. She is the widow of Admiral John Dahlgren of the United States Navy and the, I think it's stepmother, not true mother, to Ulrich Dahlgren, the cavalryman who, uh, if you recall, was killed on the cavalry raid on Richmond where they were attempting to capture Davis in the cabinet. And in fact, it was a big and kind of nasty affair. Well, I don't know what Carmen wrote to her, but here is what she wrote back. Dear Sir, your favor of June 14 is received, wishing to know if I will give the government permission to erect on my property at Fox's Gap a memorial of General Garland, CSA. With thanks for your courtesy, I regret to have to say that I can never willingly consent that such a marker be erected on property owned by me. Truly sorry, Madeline Dog. Isn't that the nicest go to hell letter you ever heard? <laughs> you know, her son's killed by the Confederates, and you want to put the Confederate monument on her property? Uh, no. But a nice note. <coughs> Not long before he died, Joe Harsh and I talked about this letter because it was one of the ones I discovered in New York and I don't think anybody had seen it. Uh, it's from Charles Marshall. And Joe Harsh always described Charles Marshall as sort of Lee's key aide, sometimes even Lee's brain. He wrote all of Lee's after action reports. He probably knew more about what Lee was thinking at any given time than anybody else in the army. 
and uh, Marshall again became a lawyer in Baltimore after the war. He and Carmen corresponded pretty frequently. And uh, Carmen wrote to ask him uh, exactly what time it was that Lee had crossed Antietam Creek coming toward Sharpsburg on the morning of the 15th of September. And Marshall uh, wrote back in all oh, like seven or eight pages, he is a lawyer, uh, his answer. <laughs> Generally left the foot of South Mountain where he was at the time the retreat towards the Potomac began. He did not leave the ground until 10 p.m. on the 14th of September. At that time, he was disabled in consequence of a fall, which he had on the battlefield of Second Manassas, in consequence of which he was unable to use his bridle arm for more than two months. When he left the battlefield of South Mountain, the retreat towards the Potomac River began. He was riding in his ambulance, and I rode in front, guiding him through the troops, artillery, and trains, which were moving toward the Potomac River from Boonesboro. General Lee had not heard of the fall of Harper's Ferry, and the army that had been engaged at South Mountain was put in motion for the Potomac River. Okay, uh, so pretty much straightforward facts as we know it. But one of the stories that's in the manuscript is that Lee came to a high meadow just off the turnpike on the eastern bluffs of Antietam Creek, and uh, while he was there, got out of the ambulance, was walking around looking at the terrain when a woman in a nearby farmhouse brought him a cup of coffee. And uh, of course it was at that point that the courier from Jackson arrived, said Harper's Ferry is going to surrender in the morning. Lee makes the decision not to go across the Potomac but to make the stand at Sharpsburg. It's a critical point in the campaign. And when Joe Harsh and I used to talk, he would say, have you ever found the source for the coffee store? Because it's in the manuscript, Carmen says it happened, nobody else does. And I always would say, nope, haven't found the coffee store. But further reading of Marshall's letter, because remember, what Carmen wanted to know was, what time did he reach Antietam Creek? Generally reached the Antietam about sunrise on the morning of the 15th of September. I was very much fatigued, having spent the whole night in the saddle after the exhausting efforts of the day, before, and when the general got out of his ambulance on top of the hill overlooking the Antietam on the road to Sharpsburg, I threw myself down in a hay pile that I found near the road and promptly fell asleep. While I was there, some lady in the neighborhood sent to General Lee a can of coffee heated by a spirit lamp. Knowing that I was greatly fatigued and finding me sound asleep, the general directed the mess servant who brought the coffee to him to keep some of it for me when I awoke. He left me sleeping, rode down to the bridge in his ambulance, and crossed the Antietam River into Sharpsburg. I did not follow for some time because I did not awake until the sun was directly shining in my face. From these facts, it is clear that General Lee did not cross Antietam Creek into Sharpsburg until at least 8 o'clock in the morning on September 15th. So, Herman got his answer. But think about this for a moment and what Lee's doing. Because I would argue to you <laughs> September 15, 1862, is the worst day in Lee's life up to that point. This is the man that about seven days earlier had been writing optimistic letters from Frederick about let's get in touch with the Lincoln administration, see about ending the war, we're in their territory threatening their capital, the elections are coming up, uh, if the Lincoln government rejects this, then this could be a factor in the election. People might uh, turn against the Lincoln administration. And what's happened? In those seven days, everything has collapsed. The Harper's Ferry operation is in jeopardy. Jackson uh, has not yet taken Harper's Ferry. The Union Army has pushed Lee's army off of South Mountain at night, forcing a night retreat. Everything is falling apart. His army is in danger of being destroyed, caught in piecemeal. <coughs> by a Union Army advancing more rapidly than he wanted. Add to that that Lee probably has not slept in two days. We know from orders and people who talked to him that he didn't sleep at all on the night of the 14th and probably not on the night of the 13th. So on the morning of the 15th, he's running on 48 hours of no sleep. His arms are bandaged and in splints. He's in pain. He's a man who's used to doing his own reconnoitering and he can't. He's forced to ride in an ambulance. 
And here, the whole fate of the Confederacy now weighing down on his shoulders with potential destruction of his army. And what does he think about? Well, Marshall might like a cup of coffee, too. What does that tell us about Lee, the man? Consideration of others. I think it's extraordinary at a time when most of us would be so frustrated that we wouldn't think of anything except our own problems, that Lee has the humanity to say, leave a cup behind for Marshall. He's tired, too. And I just find that to be an friend of mine and a great friend to battlefield preservation, Dr. Tom Clemens. Thank you. That was quite a build-up. Uh, I'll try to live up to that. A uh, couple of things. Uh, I do uh, want to say that I'm very uh, happy to be here tonight. Uh, anytime I get a chance to visit this lovely city and uh, see so many people who I've met elsewhere, it's a, it's a good time and uh, it's really been a very enjoyable trip. Uh, Secondly, uh, we are continuing to try to preserve the various sites of the Maryland campaign. We're very fortunate with Antietam that the battlefield itself is almost completely intact. And thanks to an awful lot of very dedicated people who work very hard, uh, there are scenic easements on about nearly 5,000 acres around the 3,000 acres of the battlefield. Uh, so it really will be preserved in perpetuity. Uh, much the way it looked in 1862, and that's something that a whole lot of people had a hand in, and I think everybody needs to be proud of. All right, Antietam as you've never heard it. Why do I say that? Uh, for the last 12 years or so, I have been living very closely with Ezra Carman. Uh, interestingly, because he died in 1909. But... Uh, <laughs> He left behind a massive legacy for us as historians and Civil War enthusiasts. As part of his duties as the historical expert at Antietam Battlefield, and that was his title, by the way, historical expert. Uh, no real historian wants to be called an expert, of course, because as soon as somebody finds out they, they know something that you don't, then they say, well, I'm going to be an expert if you don't know that Great Aunt Sally's <laughs> kitchen had a cannonball that went through it on the third of Jim. Yeah. <laughs> right. On the other hand, he was uh, awarded as historical expert the princely salary of $200 a month, so th some things don't change. Uh, but... What he did was not only lay out the battlefield as you see it today, the avenues, Branch Avenue, Cornfield Avenue, Carmen created them, they didn't exist. The black and white cast iron tablets that you see that explain what happened, Carmen created them. Uh, they don't come from a book or any other source. He wrote them himself. Uh, the time sequence maps that he created that show uh, what happened between dawn and 5.30 in the afternoon in 14 color maps showing every regiment uh, at L, or at least every brigade through the entire day. Carmen created all that. He also created an 1800 page handwritten manuscript history of the whole campaign, most of which is here in front of me, and some of you have already read. I have uh, jokingly referred to volume two as uh, everything you ever wanted to know about Antietam and a whole bunch more. Because he in such excruciating detail wanted to know what happened. He used a lot of sources. Uh, he used the official records. They were published by the time he was working in the 1890s, and so he was able to look at the ORs. He uh, used other sources, uh, the Battles and Leaders series. Uh, he also used regimental history. Uh, uh, many of them were published by the 1890s, because paragons of truth and virtue. Uh, but one of the richest and least explored sources were the veterans themselves. In fact, the Battlefield Board took out advertisements in newspapers asking for veterans to send in their memoirs of the battle and what happened to them. 
Uh, this is even before carbon came onto the board. Can everybody see the screen okay? I'm probably in your way, right? Sorry, right, I'm only 5'6". <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, half the room goes Mickey too. Anyway, uh, so they solicited uh, essentially memoirs from veterans. Carmen himself was a veteran of the battle. He served in the 13th New Jersey, one of the brand new regiments there. And some of these veterans sent in some pretty good stuff. This is a letter from somebody named Rufus R. Dawes. Ever hear of him? No. Okay. And what Dawes did, and I'm going to use my low-tech pointer here, <coughs> Dawes responded. This is a snippet of the base map that Carmen had created, and Dawes has marked on here the movements of his regiment, one for one, essentially in col close column by division. Number two, where Shell landed in the column, here. And this is coming down from the north woods toward the uh, Miller Farm, and here is the cornfield here, the Miller Farm building. And so you can see the movements of Dawes's regiment throughout the day, key to the text here. And there's dozens of these letters in the files. In fact, uh, by dozens, it doesn't even cover it. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, not everybody was, of course, as accurate in their memoirs as Dawes was. This is a quote, uh, if you can't read this in the back. My experience shows that out of 100 letters written, I get replies to about 50, and not more than four or five are of any value. It takes more trouble to eliminate myths than to get solid facts. This is Ezra Carmen writing to his friend John Gould. That's Gould down here. Gould spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, where exactly uh, Joseph Mansfield was shot, and he wrote also to everybody he could find that was alive to get their memoirs of what happened. And Gould and Carmen traded sources and wrote back and forth regularly. Now, those of you who have ever done any mass marketing, if you're getting 50 replies out of 100 letters you sent out, you're going, I'd kill for that ratio, right? <laughs> you know? But we have to be realistic. You're asking somebody to provide precise details of something that happened 30 or more years ago when they were quite young. And there are dozens of letters, particularly uh, from Union soldiers, that run something like, let's see, Antietam. Yeah, that was 30 years ago. I never looked at a map. I haven't been back since. But I remember we went across the stream and threw a patch of woods into an open field where we had a big fight. <laughs> That's a very genuine memoir, okay? It's also not very helpful because Carmen is trying to create as precise a record as he could get of what happened. Now, mostly, he's interested in who is shooting at who and where were they on the field because he wants that for his narrative and for his maps. And those of you who've read any of Volume 1 or Volume 2, you know that that's what he's really big into is where are they, what are they doing? And that's as it should be. Uh, you know, if, you've, if again, if you've looked at any manuscript, it's not terribly literarily written. Uh, it's not full of these human interest stories that uh, make sometimes the war seem much more real to us. Without meaning to sound disparaging, Carmen is a government employee doing a government job. He's told to document what happened, and by golly, that's what he's doing. But when you get into some of these letters, as I have done, there are some real absolute gems in here that uh, I think need to see the light of day. So I'm calling this Antietam as you never heard it because what I'm going to do is share some of these letters which I'm pretty sure you have not heard, including if you behave yourselves and stay awake. Geez, a couple of drinks, all that turkey. I figure I've got till about 8.45 tops and you're going to be face down on the table there. But, if you're real good, stay awake to the end. I'll tell you a Robert E. Lee story you never heard. Okay? So, uh, now, what to make of these letters? Because as Carmen says to Gould, separating myths from reality. 
how accurate is your memory of something that happened 30 years ago? Should we take that to the bank? Yeah, you know, I don't know about you all, but the farther away I get from being 20-some years old, the better I was when I was 20-some years old. <laughs> right? And you'll see some of that too. But as I say, just uh, so what I'd like to do is just kind of randomly share some selected uh, little gems from these letters. Now, where are all these letters in case you want to go see them today? A substantial number of them are in the National Archives in the Antietam Studies. There's three big boxes full of Carmen correspondence or battlefield uh, board papers that they're officially called. There's also a small number of letters and the maps and the actual manuscript in the Library of Congress, so you can kill two birds with one stone in D.C. But Carmen's diary, lot of photographs, and his personal papers uh, are in, some of his personal papers are in the New Jersey Historical Society in a not terribly nice section of Newark, by the way. Uh, and lastly, when he died, his son took a whole pile of papers, six feet of shelf space, to the New York Public Library. Not exactly sure why. And so to edit this manuscript properly, I had to find all of the letters I possibly could, organize them into file folders by brigade so that when Carmen writes about a brigade, I've got all the sources he looked at because Carmen had the habit of directly quoting people and books without ever attributing it, which a lot of 19th century historians did. Yeah, Mary's getting all excited, you know, by golly, I have that plagiarism, boy, I skin them and hang their hide on my office door to threat for the others, right? So, lots of times in trying to match up things, I ran into some just neat little stories. For example, Elijah White, remember, anyone remember Elijah White, 35th Virginia Cavalry? He was around, he lived in outside of Leesburg and actually owned land on the south side of the Potomac River at White's Ford where much of the army crossed. And he met with uh, Lee in advance to uh, go into Maryland. Well, live white letters are practically non-existent, but in the Carmen papers I found one. And he's giving very precise details about the planet. I'm quoting from his letter of June 2nd, 1896. The night before crossing, General Jackson's headquarters was at Big Spring, the house of Washington Ball, two miles northeast of Leesburg on the Leesburg Point of Rocks Road. General Lee's headquarters was at the house of Henry T. Harrison in Leesburg, Virginia. By order of General Jackson, I went with him to General Lee that night, at which time they determined on the march for the next day. General Jackson wanted me to go in front the next day. I did so, crossed at White's Ford on my own at that time, and camped that night near Three Springs, Frederick County, Maryland. This is basically Buckystown, a few miles south of Frederick. Now, Carmen obviously wrote, asked him for some information. He got it back. But, tacked on to the end, I will here mention one of General Jackson's peculiarities. He ordered me to attend him starting a little after dark. He rode over the road we marched that day, nearly back to the Potomac River, and then back to camp again, not speaking a word. How many of you heard that Jackson story? It's in several of the books on the Maryland campaign. But nobody ever knew where it came from, and it's, it's in Carmen's manuscript. But now we know it came from a letter from Wise White to Carmen who told him the story. That's the sort of things I'm trying to get at is, okay, Carmen says something in his manuscript, how do we know it's true? Or at least, how do we know where it came from so we can decide for ourselves whether it's true or not? And this is one of those examples where Carmen is quoting somebody else. Now, something everybody likes to talk about. Lost order. Oh, we could talk forever about lost order. One of the things that struck me when I was working on volume one is that the whole chain of events of how Special Order 191 was verified by a Union staff officer was very accurately laid out by Carmen. And what's interesting is in several later studies, they mangle it. Lots of people will say, oh, well, Sam Pittman, the Union staff officer, was in the old army with 
Robert Chilton, who wrote The Lost Order. No, he wasn't. Pittman didn't join the United States Army until long after Chilton resigned his commission. How do we know that? Because Pittman and Carmen knew each other, and Carmen wrote to him. May 3rd, 1897, Colonel Sam Pittman, Detroit, Michigan. My dear Pittman, I'm anxious to know the hour of the day, September 13th, 1862, that General Lee's lost order, number 191, was handed to you by Lieutenant Colonel Colgrove, and at what hour it was delivered to General McClellan's headquarters. I'm compiling a history of the Maryland campaign, and the information is important to me. Then he goes on to say, how is the world using you? As time goes on, I see less and less of the old comrades, and they gradually drop out of sight. Whenever you come this way, inquire for me at the War Department. They're old friends. Pittman's a staff officer in the 12th Corps. Carmen served from 1862 to 1865 in the 12th Corps, or the 20th Corps as it became. So he knew it. Now, Pittman writes back and says, my recollection is that it was sometime earlier than noon that Colgrove appeared with Lee's order. It certainly could not have been later. I did not take the order myself as we were momentarily expecting orders to move forward, which expectation was heightened by the importance of the paper so opportunely falling into our possession. I could not be spared to personally carry the paper to General McClellan, and Colonel Colgrove was an error on that point. Colgrove has already written an article about this in Battles and Leaders. Carmen throws another wrinkle into this. Dear Pittman, since yours of the 7th, I have received a letter from General Nathan Kimball, who says he carried the Order 191 of General Lee to General McClellan and delivered it to him personally, and at the time was not later than 9.30 a.m. And he goes on to add some more details. So Carmen's saying, hey, wait a minute, Kimball says he's involved. Pittman writes back, and again, I'm kind of cutting through a lot of this, but he says, uh, from what General Kimball writes you, it would appear that the paper never came into either Williams' hands or mine, so that some strange mist must have clouded Kimball's memory. <laughs> and again, Carmen answers. I confess I am somewhat surprised at Kimball's assertion that he handed the lost dispatch to McClellan in person, made no reference to Williams or yourself. He is a very old man and failing health and liable, as you say, to be a little misty in his recollection. Okay. So, as a historian, he's doing a pretty good job of kind of evaluating his sources. Well, we know what he's saying, but is he really saying what's accurate? And speaking of Alpheus Williams, Alpheus Williams is a fellow on the uh, left of the screen, as you're seeing it, with perhaps the award for best mustache. <laughs> and on the right, one of his subordinates, General Sam Crawford, who wins the award for best sideburns. <laughs> yeah? <coughs> well, it was a surprise to me to find out that Williams and Crawford did not get along very well. And uh, there's some interesting aspects of this. Now, you probably are aware of Alpheus Williams, that he, from time to time, is a corps commander, had been a division commander all through the war, serves the entire war as a brigadier general, even though he has commanded a division at least, and sometimes a corps, for much of this time. Why does Williams never get to be major general or receive much recognition? Another Michigan by the way. He's not West Point. And he, if you read his memoirs from Cannon's mouth, he's quite vociferous about the fact that uh, he's not one of the inside clique and he's not getting promoted or recognized. Well, in the spring of 1863, Williams felt slighted enough when McClellan's after action report was published that he wrote a multi-page letter to McClellan, April 18th, 1863, complaining about the fact that 12th Corps did not get much credit in uh, McClellan's after action report. And this goes on and on and on, but uh, let me just again give you some highlights. Uh, <laughs> Your report couples the name of Crawford with that of Sedgwick in a manner to lead to inf the inference that they were wounded in the same charge. This is quite a mistake. It was as late as 2 o'clock, if I think not later, that General Crawford, coming from the toward the rear alone, reported that he had received a slight wound. 
He showed me what seemed to be a very small puncture in the thigh and said somebody shot him from a cornfield with a fowling piece. I had seen General Crawford but once before during the entire battle. He came to me again during the early evening, said he should be obliged to go to the rear, but would return in the morning. He has never rejoined his command. No surgeon here ever saw this wound, which proved to be so much more serious than General Crawford himself anticipated. He did not pretend that it was received in any charge, and I'm quite positive it could not have been. Doesn't think much of Crawford, does he? Uh, I never saw General Crawford, uh, as I remember, but once from the commencement of the action to the time he reported his wound in the afternoon. Uh, and he goes on to say some other nasty things. Interestingly enough, a copy of this is sent to Carmen, and Carmen puts his own little note at the end of this. Now, Carmen is commanding the 13th New Jersey, which is the second brigade in Crawford's division. And Carmen writes this. General Crawford had it reported in the Philadelphia papers that he was wounded while rallying my regiment. I saw General Crawford but once that day, and then he was safely ensconced behind a ledge of rocks where nothing could touch him. <laughs> and isn't it interesting that from this minor wound in the thigh, Crawford goes home and doesn't rejoin the army again until not long before Gettysburg, where he's transferred to the Fifth Corps. Hmm. Sounds like the swift boat. So, and in fact, speaking of Williams, he and Carmen were good friends, and they corresponded back and forth quite a bit about Antietam. There are several letters. Again, uh, just to show you what he thinks of Crawford. Uh, that he was... Uh, here's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Uh, he, he says, uh, I told General Hooker that Gordon's line of direction would bring him to Meade's support. I would detach the rearmost brigade of Greens to give him support. I rode from Hooker to Green and sent his third brigade, Goodriches, to report to Gibbon. Uh, and he goes on to say, I met Colonel Knight in a wood road near our center, greatly afflicted and in tears at the death of Captain Brooks of his regiment and the general havoc in his small regiment. He had not heard of the death or wounding of Mansfield and that he was now in command of the brigade. I told him to look up the new regiments, get the brigade in order, and go uh, and do a dashing thing. It gave him new life and he dashed off full of zeal. When I next saw him, his regiments were huddled, huddled together in the edge of the woods, what was left of them anyway, and a Methodist preacher was exhorting one of them uh, to a large group to die as patriots. Well, so, you get the idea that Williams and Crawford don't get along, and uh, again, a little bit of infighting amongst generals. Speaking of the Union High Command, this is a section of one of Carmen's maps, and let me just point out that, uh, as you can see there, in sort of a color, Confederate shown in red, there's sort of a greenish cast of the trees here in the east woods. And I brought this up because I don't have a picture of the fellow we're talking about, but this is a fellow named Halstead in the 26th New York, part of Colonel Christian's brigade in Ricketts' division fighting in the East Woods. Anybody know anything about Colonel William Christian as far as Antietam's concerned? Oh, well, there's got to be an Antietam Sharpie in here somewhere. He's the one who deserted his brigade and left them to go into the fight without getting turned around and left. Carmen handles this very delicately in his manuscript. He says that as Christian's brigade approached the uh, fighting in the East Woods, some of the senior staff became demoralized by the shell. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what Halstead, one of the officers in the 26th New York, had to say. We were moving off the field. Uh, while we, when we were moving off the field, the white-haired general officer rode along with his staff. Uh, crying, where is General French? This is Sumner in the East Woods saying, where is General French? There is one little incident that occurred soon after our getting into line that morning and moving toward the woods. 
but while we were still in the open field, an orderly came to our Colonel Christian, who at this time was nearly in the rear of our regiment, about 10 rods, and I think it must have been for purpose of having him report or attend to something further to the right or west. A soldier of the Mexican War and a man of many noble qualities, he was, but he could not stand shells, and there in the open ground, in sight of all our regiment and some others, he dismounted from his horse and started leading his horse. As shells burst over our heads and around us, and although they were quite plenty, he would duck or dodge his head and go crouching along to the rear. He soon resigned, and I think largely on account of this. I repeat this not to tell tales out of school so much as to have you know what I know about our camping in the rear of the woods in which we fought. Several other people in that regiment also wrote to Carmen, some of them even more strongly. And one of the officers of the 26th says that the men of the regiment went to Christian that night and said, you have to resign right now. If you don't, don't be charged as a coward brought against you because you deserted the brigade as we were going into the battle. And yet Carmen just sort of soft pedals it. And I find that intriguing. Why? Uh, I don't know, he never says. But I'll offer my conjecture, and you can feel free to agree or disagree. Carmen saw a lot of the war. He was in 23 battles. As you know, after being in Antietam, the 12th Corps also engaged at Chancellorsville, uh, not so much at Fredericksburg. But when they go west, combined with the 11th Corps, uh, they fight the uh, campaign from Chattanooga down to Atlanta, the battles around Atlanta, Carmen's on the march to the sea with the 20th Corps and up into the Carolinas. He saw a lot of the fighting. And I think fighting men better than people who have never been in combat have the understanding that everybody has a breaking point. Everybody sooner or later reaches a point where they just say, I can't take it anymore. And I think people who have been shot at tend to be a little bit more sympathetic than us armchair generals who haven't. I want to judge who's a coward. So I think that may be why Carmen soft pedals this. And again, and as I want to emphasize, these are just random stories. I'm not going to try to connect this into any sort of uh, intelligible narrative. There isn't one, but I just find some of these letters to be so compelling. This is a young fellow named Lewis Reed, 12th Massachusetts. Uh, this is again Ricketts Division fighting uh, in the East Woods and in the uh, eastern portion of the cornfield. And I really liked this letter because writing on April 13, 1894, uh, Reed gives some very specific details about what happened there. We advanced very early on the 17th, not later than 6 a.m., I think in a southwesterly direction through a cornfield, the enemy was directly in our front. We followed our skirmishers, two companies of our regiment, for a short distance. When our skirmishers rejoined the regiment, I think they both followed close in our rear. We were under a heavy fire from the start. We advanced a short distance and come to a low wall with an old fence on top. I do not know how far our line of battle it was. I hope to find that line of that wall sometime. We were losing men about this time from a rebel battery in our front. We advanced down at that time in plain sight of a high fence and a rebel line of battle in the act of advancing beyond the fences towards us. We were under very heavy fire, muskets and cannonball, and men were falling very fast. Being in the position of a sergeant, I did not fire my musket. The rebels did not get beyond the fence. My comrades were falling. I saw Captain Reed as he was wounded in the hand. My friend and tent mate, Ben Curtis, fell, never to rise again. I saw the roulette buildings, also the Dunkard Church on my right front. I noticed heavy fighting on my right, 10th Maine, 2nd Massachusetts, and thousands of others, while going over to take command of the company on our left, uh, Captain, and it's illegible, was killed. It probably was not many minutes after my comrade Ben fell before I found myself on the ground with a strange feeling covering my whole body. I did not seem to be suffering much, and I remember someone attempting to help me up and then left me. Afterwards, uh, I blamed it on Phillips of our company. I do not know how long I laid in that condition. I was wounded on the right side of my neck, just above my collarbone. My right arm was useless. 
With my left hand, I found my shirt and blouse filled with blood, and I supposed it was my last day on earth. I had the usual feelings of home and friends and thousands of thoughts running through my mind at once. After a while, the thoughts came to me to try to get up and away from the dead persons around me. With my left hand, I loosed my cartridge belt and knapsack and all that around that burdened me. And with other things, I left the canteen full of water. Uh, it happened I did not suffer much for the want of water, but I have thought since that under like circumstances I would not leave my canteen again. I hope it helped some poor fellow out of his suffering. After many attempts, I got to my knees, tried to get on my feet, but not yet. I was obliged to wait for a while. And he goes on to talk about how he makes his way to the rear, etc. And I thought, you know, you don't very often see somebody giving him that detail, exactly what it felt like to get shot. So, a little interesting. This young lad on the left is James Dinkins. This is a picture of him as an old man when he wrote uh, a memoir. Uh, and because he wrote memoirs and Carmen saw that it was published, Carmen wrote to him and asked him for his uh, thoughts about Antietam. And Dinkins writes back, I am positive that I can retrace our entire movement from the time we crossed at Shepherdstown until we returned on Friday the 19th of September. Dinkins, by the way, is in the 18th Mississippi. This is Barksdale's brigade. It is my recollection that we moved in a northerly direction from Shepherdstown, first halted in the small cemetery just beyond or north of the little town, rested a few minutes. While there, was, I was on a detail to fill canteens, and I think I could point out the spot on the branch where I did so. After leaving the cemetery, we moved forward, north, I think, about five or 600 yards to a woods, formed a line of battle, we were about a thousand yards at that time from the line, from the front line of battle. After remaining there a few minutes, we moved by the left flank in columns, four or five hundred yards through the woods, entered a plowed field. When the order was given to left front in the line, I can certainly point out the position General Lee occupied with the Richmond howitzers as we passed him. And by the way, I don't think he did see Lee, but he thinks he did. But what attracted me to Dinkins is how he ends his letter. And I think you couldn't find a better justification for battlefield preservation than what Dinkins has to say. Dinkins says, I think it is the duty of every individual, as well as the government, to indicate as far as possible all the historic places. Future generations looking at the markers will swell with pride as they read of the heroic character of their ancestors and they will also have more appreciation of peace when they learn from the horrors of that war. Now, for my money, that ought to be described in the national sense. But a great outlook on preservation, I think, and one that uh, I'm sure Mary will get into print sooner or later someplace. <laughs> this, by the way, is where Dinkins was going. This is McClaws' counterattack in the West Woods. Kershaw, South Carolina is going here. Barksdale, Mississippi is coming up and catch, catching Cedric's division on the flank, barreling into the 42nd New York of Dana's brigade, etc. So this is where Dinkins is writing about that's what he was doing there in the battle. Now, you probably know the fellow on the writing screen pretty well, Daniel Harvey Hill. He was one of the uh, questions in the trivia, or answers in the trivia tonight, right? Hill commanded a division at Antietam, and one of his brigades uh, included the 3rd North Carolina Infantry, commanded by William DeRosset here on the left of the screen. DeRosset Hill and the Lieutenant Colonel of the 3rd North Carolina, a fellow named Thruston, generated a huge stack of letters in the 1880s. And mostly, one of the things they're talking about is the brigade commander uh, that commanded the brigade the 3rd North Carolina was in. This is a southern general named Roswell Ripley. Not generally on the hit parade of 100 best generals in the war, right? This is D.H. Hill. And if, again, if you're talking about D.H. Hill, he's sort of acerbic and sarcastic about everybody and everything. There's not much that suits D.H. Hill. 
doesn't mind pointing out what doesn't suit him. So here's what D.A. Hill has to say about Roswell Ripley. Uh, Colonel DeRossin, I've read both your letters with deep interest. They are full of important information. In regard to Ripley, I had feared that he was either a coward or a traitor. You know that he was a Yankee by birth. <laughs> I learned that while he was on the coast of South Carolina, he was more than once denounced to his face as a coward. He left there in a bad odor. But I knew nothing of this at the time. But his keeping his brigade out of the fight at Gaines Mill and South Mountain convinced me that he would not do. Had I known his character at South Mountain, I would have put his brigade on the left where it could have been seen. So you get the idea, again, that you know, D.H. Hill doesn't think much of Ripley. Now this is DeRossett writing back. And he says, at Sharpsburg, while we were fighting three lines in the front with Buck and Ball, there appeared on our right uh, a brigade in column of battalion, which was halted about 75 yards from the right company. At this time, there were no troops to be seen. Uh, Ripley had been wounded, unfortunately for his reputation, not fatally. <laughs> So it's sort of interesting that uh, you know the myth of the lost cause does not extend to cover <laughs> Ripley from the uh, slings and arrows of D.H. Hill and people who served under him. In fact, in a couple of other letters, there's uh, one of the officers goes to Ripley and says, you know, the men really would fight much better if you would come up on the fighting line and kind of expose yourself to some danger. And, and Ripley does very briefly, is slightly wounded and immediately hightails it to the rear. <laughs> Alexander Shevis Haskell, uh, graduate of Abbeville, uh, or South Carolina College, and lived in Abbeville, South Carolina. He's an aide and adjutant general to uh, a brigade of South Carolinians commanded by a fellow named uh, Maxie Gregg. Gregg's Brigade, it's A.D. Hill's division. And these are some of the last Confederates, of course, to arrive on the uh, battlefield at Antietam. And uh, again, Chavez Haskell gives us some real interesting insights to the uh, fighting there. But one of the things that struck me about this letter, most of you probably know that uh, at an obscure battle in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg, Lee had given firm orders that all of the field officers were to go in on foot, not mounted. Well, evidently, the same order was given at Antietam. Yeah, this is Haskell. As we were going into action, a preemptory order came from General Lee that officers must dismount. General Gregg and staff obeyed. The line must have proceeded a little distance, for I remember hot fighting, one regiment beginning to fall back under a false cry that their ammunition was exhausted. The line rallied, however, and the whole brigade pushed on. About this time, I told, I told General Gregg it was absolutely impossible for me to do my duty to chapter on the fight at Shepherd's Down Ford and a couple other chapters from Carmen's manuscript to keep this at a manageable length. And so in volume three, I think I have persuaded the publisher to let me at least publish some of these letters so that people get a sense. Because to me, as I say, Carmen wants the facts, and yet here are the people talking about what Antietam means to them. And I find that to be much more compelling than who's shooting at who. Uh, you know. And so I would like to publish some of them at least, and that would be in volume three. It'll probably be paperback, smaller, and 
less expensive. Uh, and so, Lord willing, if uh, things go well and the publisher doesn't object, that will happen. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, did Carmen spend a lot of time trying to track down why Special Order 191 was lost? And does he shed any light on that? Did Carmen spend a lot of time trying to track down why, uh, why Special Order 191 was lost or how it was lost? He doesn't spend a lot of time. He mostly writes to Pittman and gets the narrative from him because he figures Pittman's a source. He's aware of Sergeant Bloss in the 27th Indiana who found it, and he quotes Bloss a couple times. Uh, Bloss is, by that point, publishing things in the uh, uh, Mollus letters, papers. Uh, but he doesn't dwell a whole lot on how it got lost, who lost it, uh, or where it was found, particularly. Now, we have, of course, since quite a bit, and there's a lot of controversy about it. But he was more concerned about how it affected the campaign than the details that you and I want to know. Uh, so, yeah, not really. Uh, interestingly enough, and it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's gone now, but uh, the folks in the Northern Illinois Roundtable got to see the original 191 orders in Monocacy Battlefield when we did the trip there, what, three, four weeks ago? Yeah, uh, in October. Uh, and not only were the original lost orders there that you could read, but what I found compelling is there were letters written by both Corporal Mitchell and Sergeant Bloss referring to the finding of the order. And right after the, you know, I think Bloss was writing on September 20th and talked about Mitchell finding them. So it was pretty neat stuff. But it's, you know, those are the sort of details we care about, but that doesn't really make much difference with campaigns. So Carmen will focus on it very much. But if you want to talk about all that, we can stay afterward. <laughs> yes, sir. Why do you think, so, Kermit saw quite a bit of fighting in the war. Why, why do you think the show was so focused so much on Why did Carmen, who was in so many battles, simply choose to focus on Antietam? I'm not real sure. He was in battles before then. He's wounded on the peninsula at the Battle of Williamsburg in May of 1862. Interestingly enough, he gets disability for a wound to his right arm, which I'm going had something to do with the weight he wrote. And when I started this project, I didn't wear glasses, and these are blended by focals. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, in his diary, shortly after the battle, he talks about wanting to make a map of the battlefield and going in town and talking to citizens in the area. I mean, he gets letters from a lot of civilians that were living on the battlefield. It just evidently was very big in his mind. Now, he collected letters about a lot of other things. His total collection of letters are, are thousands more than I have uh, for Antietam. And they cover everything from the Western battles in Virginia in 1861 to Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and things like that. He was the historian of Antietam from 1894 to 1905. And in 1905, he goes to Chickamauga and is the chairman of the Chickamauga Battlefield Board. Uh, up until Christmas Eve of 1909, when he dies. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, 20th. And if you go to uh, Arlington, when you're standing on the front steps of the Custis Mansion looking across the river, if you go about 200 yards to your right and halfway down the hill, Carmen's grave is right there. He's very, very near the Custis Lee Mansion at Arlington. So he focused on Antietam a lot, but there are, you know, partially finished chapters of lots of other battles and campaigns. I think he was going to write a history of the whole war if he lived long enough. And there are tons of letters about West Virginia, uh, Chancellorsville, uh, Chickamauga, Wahatchee, you name it. Uh, and other, I haven't even begun to get into those. Yes, sir. Anything from in those letters, particularly from the Union side, about McClellan's failure to follow through? Uh, Anything on the Union side about McClellan's failure to follow through? Well, it's in the narrative. He mostly uses the official sources, but let me let me sum it up for you real quickly because I think this is one of many myths about Antietam that needs to be exploded. Uh, McClellan issued attack orders on the night of the 17th to resume the battle the next morning. Now, during the night, he received information that made him postpone those orders before daylight. What did he receive? Well, first of all, he was expecting Humphrey's division to arrive. Humphrey's division of the 5th Corps was in Frederick on the day of the battle. They were 200 
two brigades, three brigades of all brand new regiments just enlisted. They marched from Frederick uh, 23 hours to get to Antietam Battlefield. They arrived at around dawn on the 18th, straggling and exhausted. So those reinforcements that he wanted to replace his losses from the day before aren't there. Governor Curtin has raised dozens of new militia regiments to defend the state. Some of those were at Hagerstown. McClellan expected that they too would march down to Sharpsburg to reinforce his army. But Governor Curtin was very strict about saying, no, those are Pennsylvania militia and they don't go that far away from Pennsylvania. Sorry, you can't have them. You're probably aware that McClellan had deployed four batteries of 20-pounder parrots on the East Bluffs, which bombarded the Confederate position all day long. But by nightfall, they are out of long-range ammunition. They have expended all of it that the Army had with them. Sure, there is more in the arsenal in Washington. But to get to Sharpsburg, the way that that ammunition had to go was it was loaded on railroad cars in Washington, sent to Relay, Maryland, from Relay to Baltimore, Baltimore to York, York to Chambersburg, Chambersburg to Hagerstown, where it would be offloaded from the railroad and brought by wagons to the Army. No overnight delivery. And so with no real reinforcements and no artillery ammunition to support an attack on the 18th like he could on the 17th. And when he comes down with a recurrence of the fever he contracted on the peninsula that night, he postpones the orders to attack to the morning of the 19th. And of course, when he wakes up in the morning of the 19th, Lee's gone. Now he does send the 5th Corps forward. They pursue to the fort at Shepherdstown. And uh, fighting takes place there in the evening of the 19th and on the 20th. And it is the Battle of Shepherdstown that convinces both McClellan and Lee to abandon the campaign. It's the pivotal battle of the campaign in that both of them were continuing the campaign uh, before they fought at Shepherdstown. And after Shepherdstown, they both said no. McClellan will, as you suggest, rest and recuperate his army on the uh, north bank of the Potomac River. What does Lee do? He goes to Winchester and rests and recuperates his army for the same reasons. But he gets along better with this president than the bottom of That's the device collection of all the clues. Well, thank you.